question this morning that we're going to answer in the text is, can anything separate us from God's love once we're saved? The scripture, God, in the scripture, gives us a definitive answer. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So here's what we do with that truth. Since nothing can separate us from the love of God, we are to live a life daily connected to God's love. We're going to define living a life connected to God's love as learning to walk in intimacy with the God of your salvation daily. Romans chapter 8 is one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. I feel like every time I get up here, I say something like that. But when you're in it for a week, it's like, oh my gosh, God loves us so much. But Romans chapter 8, you, if you don't walk away awestruck by the love of God, you did not read well. That, that's what this entire chapter is about, about how God loves us. So let's, let's read our scripture today. If you can and will, will you stand with me? And we're going to read Romans 8, 31 through 39. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all. How will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised and who is now at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. So we're going to take this in two chunks. The first chunk is going to be verses 31 through 34 and then 35 through 39. So the first thing I want to see you to see is God's love binds us to himself. So in verse 31, we got to ask the question, what does it mean for God to be for us? I think this is one of the greatest misconceptions in, in pop culture is that I think we believe that God is actually against us. And I don't know where it comes from. Maybe from our, like, we know deep down we're guilty and that God should not be for us. He shouldn't even care about us because we understand that we are wretches. Like, or maybe it's, maybe it's the subtle voice of the enemy whispering in our ear that God's not for you. God is against you. But when we come to verse 31, verse 31 should be earth shattering that the God of all of creation is for you. I know we've grown up in church and we understand things like this, but that's a huge deal. When we think about God being for us, we might think that he's for us like maybe we're for our favorite sports team. So, for instance, I'm for the Dallas Cowboys. Dak Prescott is the quarterback, therefore I am for Dak Prescott. But if Dak Prescott begins to underachieve for a long period of time, I'm for the Dallas Cowboys, so what do I want? I want a new quarterback. Some of you in here this morning want a new quarterback. But that's not how God is for us. My dad is a football coach. I'm for my dad. Now, whether or not my dad performs well, I don't care because I'm for my dad. I love my dad. If my dad never wins another game, guess what? I am still for my dad because I love him. God's love, God being for us, is not based on our performance. And as, he fail, as we fail, he does not love us less. 
God is for us because God is love. First John 4, 16, God defines himself as love. He says God is love. God is not cold or indifferent towards us. God is the eternal fountain of unquenchable love. And his love overflows to us. John Bunyan says this of Jesus. Love in Him is essential to His being. God is love. Christ is God. Therefore, Christ is love. And Christ will never cease to love us. God's divine love, it's embracing. It's endless. It's engulfing. And God made you God made you to love you and to be with you. Think about about creation. Let's back up. Genesis 1 and 2. God made the heavens and the earth. He made a garden. And He put people in that garden. Why did God put people in that garden? To love them and to have intimate relationship with them. Now, man failed... God made a way to continue relationship. Each covenant, God is making way for us to have relationship. And this new covenant that we're talking about this morning in Christ is different than all the other ones because we get intimacy with God like no one else has ever had. Because the God of all creation paid our debt and He sends His Spirit to indwell us so that we can love Him and that we can be with Him both in this life and the life to come. That's why God did all this. And this God of love, what He desires is you. He desires intimacy with you. But here's the problem. We grow numb and cold and indifferent to the love of God because we're always engulfed and embraced by it. So, here's the question for this morning. How do we foster in our hearts a love that won't grow cold? How do we kindle that fire so that our fire will burn bright, our love will burn bright, and we will also share the love of God with others? This goes back to the so what of the passage this morning. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Therefore, we are to live a life connected to God's love. We're defining a life connected to God's love this morning as learning to walk in intimacy with God through dailiness, through daily practices. Dailiness is being in fellowship with God so that we can tune our hearts to hear His voice as He speaks to us when we're in the Word and when we're in prayer. Look, intimacy does not come from checking boxes, right? All of us who are married know this. Intimacy comes from spending real time with your partner. So here's a diagnostic question for you. I want you to ask this of yourself. I'm going to ask it twice. Have you been spending enough time to consider yourself intimate to the voice and will of God. I'd ask that of myself this week. Because I want want each of us to know whether or not our hearts have grown numb and cold to His love. So I'm going to ask it again. Have I been spending enough time to consider myself intimate to the voice and the will of God? We'll come back to this to this question later let's go back to talking about God being for us people confuse God's divine justice as God being against man the problem is not that God is against man the problem is that man is against God Romans 5 we're born into sin by nature we are enemies with God but while we were enemies with God what did Christ do in Romans 5 he died for us See, it's not that God is against us. 
Rather, it's because we're against God. God is so far in our corner that God became flesh and dwelt among us so that we could be with him, so that we could have relationship with him. He's so far for us. He know, knew that even dying for us wasn't enough. That once we believe and confess him as Lord, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells our hearts. That's what Romans chapter 8 is all about. So that we can follow him. And then to top it all off, God is so far for us. Romans 8, 12 through 17. We get to call God this very intimate name. The name Jesus calls him. The name of Abba, Father. He has done everything for intimacy with us so that he would be glorified. And if you ever doubt whether or not God is for you, you don't have to look any further than the cross of Jesus. The cross is the proof that God is for us. Look at verse 32. It's about to tell us that much. In verse 32, we see, the extent of God's love on display in Jesus. So who can be against us if God is for us? Verse 32, he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Verse 32 is connected to verse 31 so that we know that God is for us. God willingly gave us his son because God loves us. Thomas Goodwin says this about Jesus. He says, Jesus is, Christ is love covered with flesh. The God of love became man so that he could create a relationship with us that we could love him back. That's the gospel. And here's the deal. God's love, it's so, it's just different than anything we can comprehend or understand. God's love is not like our love. God's love's not cautious. God's love's not calculating. God's love's not calloused. When we love, we want to protect ourselves from being injured. The way that God loves is so different than that because God loved us in such a way that he was willing to be injured for our benefit. That's how God loves us. Isaiah 53, 6, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Romans 4, 25, he being Jesus was delivered over to death for our sin. God poured out the treasury of heaven in giving us his son to pay our sin debt. There is nothing greater in all of heaven than Jesus And God deliberately delivered him to the cross so that he could have relationship and intimacy with you and me. Paul's showing showing that in light of this huge price paid by God, that nothing is going to separate us from God. No no one can bring any charges against God's elect. There's no one who, who can say that we're guilty. There's there's nothing powerful enough in this world. There's no situation that can separate us from the love of God. That's what he's telling us in verses um, 31 through 39. And since God has paid this huge price, we can be sure that God's going to bring to completion the work that he started in us. I, I heard a pastor illustrate it this way. So imagine that I came home and I tell my wife Jordan and I tell Ellie, my little girl, Hey, pack your stuff. I bought tickets to Disneyland. We got plane tickets. Go, go get your stuff together. They would literally lose their minds. Like Ellie's like three and she thinks she's a princess anyway. So, you know, we pack our stuff. We get a dog sitter. We go and we pay to park. Have you ever paid to park? That's expensive. We pay to park, man. We get on the plane. We fly six hours to California. We go to our, we get our rental. We go to our hotel. We sleep, the next morning we wake up and we're driving and we finally get to Disneyland and I don't know if it's land or world, whatever. And we're just inching closer and closer and closer to our final destination. Two things you need to know about me. 
I'm a cheapskate, and I hate toll roads. Somebody explain the toll road to me. No, don't, because I don't want to get in that conversation. I'm, I'm going to be mad no matter what. And I hate to pay to park. I hate to pay to park. So we're, you know, we're inching closer and closer, and finally the parking attendant, he comes up to him, the window and he says, that'll be $50. And I just vomit in my mouth. I lose my mind. I look at my wife, I said, no, I'm done. It's too much. We're going home. What do you think my wife's going to tell me? Pay the man. In the sweetest way possible, baby, right? Why? Why? The price has already been paid. I initiated it. The price has been paid. Are we going to allow something small to stop us from completing that which we started out to do? No, we're going to get in that princess picture in front of that princess castle. We're going to finish. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. The price has been paid. God is going to finish what He started. He initiated it, and He will finish it. God's love is so beyond our human comprehension. It tells us that He went so far that He didn't even spare His Son. That's how much He loves you. So if you ever doubt whether or not that God's going to finish the thing that He started in you, where's the proof? The proof is the cross. So let's look back at our text. Let's kind of, I know some of you are asking, all right, that's cool, but what about this like graciously giving me all things? That sounds good. Like, let's, let's talk about that for a second. So I think that could mean many things, but I'm confident it also means this. If God did not spare his own son from the cross, he will certainly take care of you. He's certainly going to provide us with the little, little things. He gave us the big things. He's going to give the small things too. Now, here's the deal. I don't believe that means you're going to get everything you ever want. But I believe it means you're going to get everything you ever need. And we desperately need to be conformed into the image of Jesus. Right? Romans 8, 28 says this. That God works all things out for the good of those who love Him. Now, a Lamborghini may not be for your good, but suffering might be. As a matter of fact, Paul is about to go through a lot of different kinds of suffering that can be expected by the believer. And he says that these situational sufferings are not the thing that's going to separate you from God's love. Some people believe that when suffering comes, God's gracious hand of blessing has been removed somehow from their life and that God will not continue to bless them tomorrow. Do you want proof that God's hand of blessing is on your life? You don't look at your current situation. The proof is 2,000 years ago with that empty tomb and that cross. The proof is the cross that God will continue to graciously bless you and give you all things in Jesus Christ. Not your situation. So let's look back at the text at verses 33 through 30, verse 34. And what we're going to see there is the sufficiency of the sacrifice. God's love on display for us in Jesus Christ is what we're going to see right here. So Paul gives us two questions in these verses. The first question is, who can bring any charges against us? His answer is, well, God's the one who justifies so, if God justifies us, there's no charges to be brought against us because God's also the one that can condemn us. Be, now, God, He demands payment for sin, but God Himself has provided that payment. So, if you are in Christ, when God looks at you, He does not see you as fallen, wretched, and sinful. When He looks at you, if you're in Christ, He sees you in the same holiness as His Son. We are actually holy as Christ is holy, even though we aren't. Because He justified us, not us. 
Now, the, the next question that's raised is, in verse 34, who is to condemn? The phrase could also be translated, who can say God's people are guilty? And then he points us to Jesus. So God's not going to say that we're guilty because he's already justified us. Jesus, there's, there's, there's no guilt to be brought once we're in Christ. Like, we're still going to sin. But Jesus died once and for all sins. There's no new charges to be brought against us. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I love Romans 8. It starts 8-1. For now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We end the chapter with, guess what? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We are actually saved. We've been delivered. But what have we been delivered to? Relationship. We have been delivered for relationship now and relationship in the next life. So Jesus, on top of paying our debt, on top of justifying us, on top of taking our condemnation, verse 34 tells us that Jesus stands or sits at the right hand of God making intercessions on our behalf. That's a fancy word. He's praying for us. He's pleading for us. And you're like, well, how does Jesus pray for me individually when there's all these people in the world? I don't know. He's God. He can do it. But God, Jesus Christ, is praying for you to the Father who is ready and willing to graciously give you all the things you need. But look at the other prayer partner we find in Romans chapter 8. So we're going to be in Romans 8, 26, and we're looking at the Holy Spirit here. So we have a prayer partner in the Son, but we also have a prayer partner in the Holy Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. This is the Holy Spirit that indwells us. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought to, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He searches hearts and knows what's in the mind of the Spirit, and because the Spirit intercedes for for the saints according to the will of God. The prayer ministry of the Trinity is beautiful. When we don't know how to pray, when we don't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit's making groanings. He, he's interceding. He's praying to the Father for us. Jesus, our advocate, is at the right hand of God, always praying for us. And we find the Father seated on His throne, ready and willing to pour out blessings on His children. Who are His children? Those who are in Christ. Romans 8.15, we get to call Him Abba. God, over and over and over again, is pleading with His children for them to interact with Him, for them to have relationship with Him in intimacy, in prayer. Prayer is how we become intimate with God. This is how we practice living the life connected. Look at the life of Jesus. How do we know that Jesus had an intimate relationship with the Father? Because we're revealed His prayer life. Prayer is how you will get to know God. God's given us all the tools we need to have deep, intimate, abiding relationship with Him. He's given us the body of Christ. So hey, If you don't know how to pray, look around this room. These people will pray with you. They will teach you how to pray. If you feel too weak to pray, the body of Christ will pray with you. Where you don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit is praying on your behalf anyway. The Son is sitting at the right hand of the Father praying for you. God has given you everything you needed for intimacy. Really, the only thing keeping us from an intimate relationship with Jesus is our unwillingness to get alone and be silent. We are the only thing impeding us. Look, God, He's not stingy with revealing Himself to us. But God reveals Himself to us in prayer and in the Word. And 
until you get alone with God, you're never going to know Him any deeper than a casual relationship. And I mean, it, it breaks my heart for you, and it breaks my heart for Him. I do the counseling here. You want joy? You, you, you want all these things. And these things only come from being connected to Him. But outside of the things, God is the source. He is the sun. Like the planets in the solar system, and we just revolve around Him, and He wants to know us. Your Maker and your Savior wants to reveal Himself to you. And it just it breaks my heart for you. And it breaks my heart for Him. Because He has literally moved heaven and earth for relationship with you. He's created an earth. He became man and dwelt among us for relationship. A lot of people tell me that they spend their time with God in the car on their commute. And that's awesome, by the way. I, I think that's great. I do too. I call that redeeming the time just in the natural transitions of my day. I try to refocus. I try to pray. But if that's the only time you were to spend with your significant other is while you were doing something else, you were just kind of fitting them in, would, that, would it make that person feel special or would it make that person feel like an afterthought? We need to move from fitting God into our day to centering our day around God. This is living a life connected to the source. Do you want to live a life of joy? Be connected to the love of God daily in, in daily practices. Do you, do, you, do you want to live a life of power? Do you want to be a soul winner? Do you want to change the world around you? Live a life connected to the love of God. Do you want to be free from your anxieties and depression and addiction? Daily live a life connected to the love of God. Or maybe this describes you better by your actions. You want the daily blessings of God and expect to receive them without daily connecting to God. Because when you do that, what you're really saying is you want the gifts of God, but you do not want the God of the gifts. And I don't say that to be mean. I'm saying it to challenge you because I want you to live the good life. The life of joy and the life of victory. The life of love. John 15 tells us that He is the vine and we are the branches. And when we are connected to Him, we will bear fruit. That love, that joy, that peace, that patience, that kindness, that gentleness, that self-control. We will bear fruit in the lives around us. But we have to be connected to the source. Let's, let's keep going. Let's look at verses 35 through 39. We'll see here that nothing can separate us from God's love. The, the first section here is really 35 and 36. And what we're going to see is situations can't separate us from God's love. So Paul asks the question again, what can separate us from God's love? Nothing. Now, Paul gives us a list here of things that we've seen him endure in the book of Acts. The suffering, the tribulation, the, the hunger, the neck, and all, all the things. None of those situational things separated him from the love of God. Now, one of the things we don't see him do in the book of Acts is face the sword. But we know from the book of Philippians, what does Paul say? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when he did face the sword, do you believe that the sword, the situation of the sword was the thing that separated him from the love of God? No. Situations aren't the thing. Suffering is not the thing. In verse 36, Paul goes on to quote Psalm 44, 22. He cites Scripture, I believe, to show us that sometimes it might be God's will that we suffer. It's a popular belief today when suffering comes that sometimes you're outside God's will. And I don't, that's, that's just simply not the case. 
Because what is one of the titles of Jesus? Jesus is the suffering servant. James, Peter, John, Paul. The apostles, they all faced great suffering. All of them died horrible deaths with the exception of John. And do you believe that they were separated from the love of God? This is a testimony. We believe that suffering often is not God's will for us. That's prosperity gospel. A prosperity gospel would affirm that if something bad is happening to you, it's because of your lack of faith. God forges us into the image of Christ. When metal is forged, it's stuck in the fire. And often, God's hammer in, in forging us into the image of Christ is suffering and the anvil's dependency. As we're smashed by the hammer of suffering, we find that there's nowhere to go but God, and we learn dependency. As Christ was dependent on the Father, we are molded into the image of God. We're molded into the image of Jesus. Look with me now at verse 37. So, how in the world can Paul say, if we're being slaughtered like sheep, are we more than conquerors? Seems like an oxymoron, right? Well, was, Jesus was the Lamb of God who was slaughtered, and His victory is our victory. Because Jesus conquered death, we conquer death. We are more than conquerors because we are in Christ and Christ conquered. We get to live in the victory of Jesus. Let's look at, let's look at verses 38 through 39. The power of this present age cannot separate us from the love of God. He goes on here and he lists all these powers that are seemingly strong and they're not strong enough to do it. God's love, God loves His Son. God will never let His Son go. Once you believe in Christ, you are in the Son. And you will never be ripped from the grip of God. Nothing can separate you from God's love. Christ, His dominion is more expansive than all the, pow the, the powers listed here. And we constantly, we underestimate God's love for us. We underestimate the love and power of Christ for us. Jonathan Edwards says this. I love this quote. He says, Jesus' essence begins with love. He, as it were, an infinite ocean without bottom or shore. Nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus. We, we, we base our salvation in Jesus and as long as Jesus is, we will be. Jesus is His. Jesus is eternal, and we will be His for eternity. There's nothing that can separate us from His love. The last thing I want you to see is verse 39. And we see the only condition to the promise. The only condition to all these promises is that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. So here's the deal this morning. If you know that Jesus isn't your Lord, if you've heard that quiet voice kind of whispering to you, we call that conviction. These promises aren't for you. You are separated from God. Now, God made a way that you wouldn't be separate, and we've just talked about that. But I want you to understand that if you die separated from God, you will be separated from God in an eternal place called hell. That's the reality, and it brings me no joy. My joy comes in telling you that the God of all creation sacrificed His life for you so that you could be saved and you could have relationship. And if you would confess with your mouth and you would believe in your heart, you will be saved. I want to have this conversation with you. Now, you can do it right now in your seat. You can confess Christ and He will save you. 
But if you got some questions after the service, I'm going to pray. And Brandon and the band, they're going to come up and they're going to lead us in one last song. And I'm going to be in that glass room back there. You see it? And I'm going to be standing back there and I want to have this conversation with you. But here's, here's my question for everybody else. For those of you who are believers, what's the, what's the so what about all this? Well, first, if you miss this, we've kind of wasted our time. Nothing can separate you from God's love. That should bring you joy, peace, and confidence. But since nothing can separate us from God's love, what should we do with it? What I've been pleading with you for the last 30 minutes is that you would live a life connected to His love through daily intimacy with God. This, this truth should move us to worship or love God more deeply in our daily actions. Here's the last thing I want to tell you. What draws your affections draws your actions. I met my wife in college. I met Jordan in college. And it, it took me a long time to talk her into going out with me. Like, I took no like a champ. Actually, ladies really on her. She said, just not yet. So I was like, all right, well, maybe later. So finally, after groveling and begging, she said yes. And I was going to get to take her out to some ice cream. I just had one problem. My truck was disgusting. It was a little single cab, red Chevy pickup truck. I worked out of it. It had my sweaty clothes, my tools. I'd leave shoes in there. You know, there were you know, empty food containers and bottles. And the, really, the only place to sit was in the driver's seat. There's zero chance that Jordan would have, would have went on that date. There's zero chance she would have gotten that truck. So, but what did I say a second ago? What draws our affection draws our actions. She had my affection, so I took action. And as soon as she said yes, I pulled up to a dumpster. And I just started throwing stuff away. Now, I got it cleaned out, but it was still stinky on the inside and dirty on the outside. It's just now not disgusting on the inside. So I went to the, the, the car wash place. I got that bad boy detailed, man. I cleaned it out. I was cleaning out the little crack. I was, I was getting it, man. Washed it, looking brand new. Still a problem. It stank to high heaven. It smelled like a shoe. So I went to Walmart and I bought about $100 worth of Febreze and I bombed that thing. Sprayed some cologne in there. I, I, it was a couple hours till the date, so I just left the windows ro rolled down so maybe it would air out. But I didn't want anything to stand in the way. I didn't want any distractions from the object of my affection, spending time with her. This morning, we've looked at the love of God, and we've seen that we are the object of His affection. We've seen that His divine love for us and His desire for relationship. You might be saying, look, man, all this love, it sounds good. It sounds good. I love God. I want to be intimate with God. But Cody, if I was honest with you, I just don't have time. Well, what, what did we just say? What draws your affection draws your actions. You need to create a sacred time and a sacred place. My sacred time is between 5 and 5.30. Sometimes I wake up a little late, so I give myself that little room. And it's the side arm of the couch. That's, that's my sacred time, and my sacred place is the side arm of the couch because it can hold my coffee. And it holds my books. I have a sacred time and a sacred place, and that is the rock of Gibraltar. That is the thing that will not be moved. Now, to create a sacred time and a sacred place, you're going to have to move your schedule around. And let's be real. We all have time. But we've packed our schedule full. So you're going to have to say no to some good things. 
It might be t-ball because t-ball gets you in too late and by the time you get the kids down, you're going to bed late yourself. T-ball is a good thing. It might be that third and fourth episode of that show you're watching on Netflix. You need to move your schedule. And I'm not saying set a 30 minute back. Does intimacy happen in short spurts or does intimacy happen with time? You're going to have to move your schedule by hours. Your bedtime probably can't be 11.30 or 12 anymore. It's going to have to be 9.30. Because if you want a life connected to God's love, you got to spend time with Him. And you're like, man, that's rough. That's not realistic. Is it? Do you want a life of power? Do you want a life of intimacy? Do you want a life of joy? It is realistic. But those things will not happen apart from dailiness. Now, this won't just be for your benefit. It's going to be benefit to those around you because what happens when we interact with God through the Word and in prayer? He takes that Word and He puts it in our heart. And once he implants it in our heart, what happens? It comes out of our mouths. We're looking at the dumpster fire of a world that we live in right now, and we're so often saying, the world needs to change. No, we need to change. We need to daily be intimate with God, because when we do that, God will work through us in power. Your friends and your family will get saved. Those people at work, they'll get saved. Not just that, we've been called to make disciples and you'll see those people start making disciples where they live, work, and play. And you'll see those people make disciples where they live, work, and play. And it's how the ancient world caught on fire. Because these men and these women were intimate with God and the Holy Spirit worked through them in power. I promise you God will do it in you. 